So last time I showed you photorealistic Desmos fractals, and a lot of you seemed to like it. However, I don't think I really did that project justice. I glossed over most of the inner workings of it, so I decided to make this mini-series to show you how the program actually works. I also got a lot of feedback about my audio quality and speaking rate. Thank you all for giving me feedback, I really do appreciate it. While I can't easily fix the audio quality as of now, I will be talking more slowly, especially during conceptually difficult portions of the video. On to the topic of this series, here's what we'll be covering. In this video, I'll explain ray marching itself. In part 2, I'll explain how to use ray marching to create a 3D rendering engine. In part 3, I'll explain how to use that rendering engine to make fractals. In part 4, I'll go over the rather unusual Desmos features I've used in my Desmos engine. And finally, in part 5, I'll actually explain how the Desmos implementation of the rendering engine works, applying all the information we've learned in the previous four parts. Also, if I've uploaded the next part already, you can find it in the description. Otherwise, stay tuned! Something something notification bell, I don't know. So let's talk about ray marching. Ray marching is the algorithm underlying the 3D fractal generator. To understand what it is, let's first define what it's trying to accomplish. In a 3D renderer, we are trying to draw a scene. This scene is just a 3D object. The goal of ray marching is to determine where a ray, usually a ray of light, first intersects the scene, provided it does at all. As you can imagine, knowing where a ray first intersects a scene has some startling implications for 3D rendering, because these rays can be used to model photons of light. I'll elaborate more on this topic later. Anyway, the important thing here is that the ray marching determines where a ray first intersects a scene. How does it do this? Well, first we have to define what the scene actually is. With traditional 3D rendering, a scene is usually defined as a collection of triangles that are put together to form a mesh. With ray marching, on the other hand, a scene is defined as a mathematical function called a signed distance function. This signed distance function, or SDF for short, takes a 3D vector as input and outputs the shortest distance from that point to the surface of the scene. So, for example, if you took the SDF of the point 2, 3, 4, and got 7, that would mean that you'd need to move at least 7 units away from 2, 3, 4 if you'd want any chance at reaching the surface of the scene. It's also worth pointing out that the SDF is positive if you're outside of the scene, and negative if you're inside of the scene. This is why it's a signed distance function. We can therefore infer from all these properties that the surface of the scene is defined as the places where the SDF equals 0. This makes sense because if the SDF is 0, you are 0 units away from the surface of the scene. You're literally at the surface. Now we can finally talk about the ray marching algorithm. As a reminder, we're trying to find out where a ray intersects the scene. The basis behind the ray marching algorithm is to start with a point at the beginning of a ray, and then repeatedly move it forward in discrete steps along that ray. The point is marching forward along the ray, hence ray marching. I'll call the distance the point travels every step the size of the step. The simplest way to do this is to have a fixed step size. Every time we make a step, we sample the SDF at the point's current position. If it's below zero, we know we've entered the scene and we can use the point's current position as an approximation of where the ray hit. There we go, problem solved. Well, not really. As some of you have already realized, for very thinner detailed geometry, the point might just pass through the scene entirely. On top of that, this is quite slow. A faraway geometry might take tens or hundreds of steps to reach. Why can't we realize that a faraway object is farther away, and thus use a larger step size? Conversely, why can't we realize that a nearby object is nearby, and use a smaller step size to get more detail and not worry as much about performance? Heck, why can't we do both, dynamically decreasing the step size as we approach an object to get the best of both worlds? Well, actually we can. Let's take the SDF sampled at the point's position, and use that as the step size rather than some fixed value. Remember that the SDF is the shortest possible distance between a point and the surface of the scene. Thus, if the point travels a distance equal to the SDF, it is guaranteed to either reach the scene or come up short, because by definition there is no part of the scene closer to it than that which is defined by the SDF. This solves a problem resolving detail and passing through thin geometry. As for the problem of faraway scenes, the SDF solves that too. The SDF value for faraway scenes will be very large, allowing for a similarly large step size. Of course, in doing this we've created another problem. In nearly all cases, our point will only asymptotically approach the surface of the scene. How will we determine if it actually hit the scene? The answer is to see whether the point is within a very small distance of the scene, maybe a millionth of a unit or something. This is trivial to calculate because it's literally just the SDF of the point's position once again. This will add a slight border to the scene, but it's practically unnoticeable. We could alternatively forego this entirely and just treat all rays the same regardless of how close they are to the scene. I've used both approaches in the past and they've both worked out, so it really depends on your use case. Let's recap. We have a scene in an array. 
The scene is defined by the SDF. The ray is defined by an origin point and a direction vector, which is just a unit vector representing the direction in which the ray points. To apply ray marching and thus figure out where the ray intersects the scene, we repeatedly do the following steps. First, get the step size by plugging the point's position into the SDF. And second, march the point forward by that step size. We can use the direction vector to represent moving forward a single unit. Optionally, we can also check to see if we're within the ray hit threshold, and if we are, exit the loop early. Let's visualize this process. Once that's done, we now have our intersection point. It's just the current position of the point along the ray after all of this ray marching. So now that we've got this algorithm working, we can define a scene, a point, and the direction in which that point can travel. Then using ray marching, we can determine whether the point hits the scene, and if it did, where. So that's the ray marching algorithm in a nutshell. So with that out of the way, how is ray marching used to render things? We've got this primitive operation defined that determines whether a ray intersects a scene, and where. We can use this abstraction to create a very simple 3D rendering engine. However, that is the topic of the next video in the series. As a reminder, let me know what you think of the audio quality as well as further improvements I can make to my videos in general. With all that out of the way, I'll see you in part two.